On va poursuivre maintenant avec euh, notre première table ronde qui sera en anglais. So I'll switch to English. Um, and we'll speak about the uh, Paris Agreement, uh, which intends to limit the increase in global temperatures to uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius. And now, of course, there is need to transform these promises into direct political commitments. And that's exactly what the COP24 Katowice conference was about last year in Poland. So what action should be taken by the political leaders to limit the global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius? Are the different countries prepared for this very undertaking? And uh, do we have enough political voluntarism? Well, these are the type of questions I will ask to uh, Valérie Masson-Delmotte, Michel Curtica, and Scott Barrett. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Michel Curtica, Scott Barrett, and Valérie Masson-Delmotte. I'll start with you. You're a climate scientist, you're a paleo climatologist at the CEA, which of course is a, a renowned research organism, and you co-chair the Working Group 1 of the IPCC, so that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, which aims at assessing the physical scientific basis of the climate system and climate change. Now, what we can talk with you at first is, is uh, this um, recent report that was released by the IPCC. Um, it was quite, uh, quite original, quite genuine, in fact. Uh, it's, uh, it's a report which is dubbed the 1.5 degree report. And it, it's, it's, in fact, it's a scientific guide uh, for the governments in order to um, tell them how they could take action in order to tackle this uh, climate problem. So what are the outcomes of this report? Valérie Masson-Delmotte. So oh, just a second. There you go. It should work. I just want to yes, make clear does. that the IPCC has the mandate to assess the state of knowledge based on the scientific literature, and it has the mandate not to be prescriptive. So basically, it's providing decision makers with the best state of knowledge on which choices can be made So it's science to inform decision making. And what's really specific to this report is that it's a policy invitation. It comes from COP21, because at that time, 100 countries couldn't agree on the Paris Agreement because the long-term goal, uh, limiting warming well below two degrees, was considered to be potentially dangerous by 100 of countries. And because there was a lack of knowledge about what would it imply to limit warming at 1.5 compared to two degrees or what would be the related greenhouse gas trajectories. And governments, when they accepted basically their own invitation within the IPCC plenary, um, they made a very important step because they grounded our assessment, not just in terms of climate action, but within sustainability and actions to reduce poverty, the first target of a sustainable development. So this report is novel in that it's across disciplines It's strongly grounded in social sciences, not just physical sciences. It's looking at risks and solutions in a balanced and neutral way. And it's looking at the most possible ambitious mitigation pathways. So that's really the specificity. And I summarize the report in three simple words or sentences. Each half a degree matters. And that was a surprise even for climate scientists. How strong is the signal of the differences in terms of regional climate characteristics, hazards and risks between now one degree of global warming above pre-industrial levels, a world that's half a degree warmer, and that's the world of the young generation we saw today, between 2030, 2050, and if we emit more CO2, it can be even earlier, and a two degree warmer world. So each half a degree, every half a degree matters in terms of risks. The second thing is that Every year matters. Um, there's a cumulative effect of emissions of carbon dioxide. So everywhere, without action, it's 40 billion more um, carbon dioxide emissions in the atmosphere with long-lasting effects. And every year without action means um, more risks for fragile ecosystems, 
more risks for vulnerable people and vulnerable societies, and more action later if you want to keep with the same target. So every year matters. And the third thing is every choice matters. There are multiple ways to act, but there's a small track where you can bring everyone on board, leaving no one behind, and achieve sustainable development while having a type of development that is resilient to a changing climate and a type of development that goes towards carbon neutrality as fast as possible. And that's a notion that's close to your heart, I think, the notion of a just, ethical and fair transition. So you just told us that um, every half degree matters. What does that mean? Uh, could you give us examples of, uh, for instance, ecosystems that can be uh, changed by just uh, th this little uh, modification of uh, uh, half a degree? So before talking about ecosystems, we need to do the whole track. So um, the level of warming at the surface is a good indicator of the state of the global climate system. And with an additional half a degree of warming, you'll see an enhancement of um, extreme warmth over land and in oceans. So let's take the example of tropical oceans. With each additional half a degree of warming, you'll see more frequent marine heat waves. And for instance, these heat waves called major damage to tropical coral reefs. Um, the first signs had been observed in the late 1990s, and now it's observed at a much broader scale. For a global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius, it's anticipated that between 70 and 90% of tropical coral reefs would go through severe degradation, almost all of them for two degrees of global warming. That's one example amongst many. And when we talk about ecosystem, it's not just the beauty of the world, um, it's also ecosystems and their services to people. Coral reefs um, have economical value for protecting coasts, for uh, providing food, um, supporting fisheries, and they also act as a hub for the reproduction of something like 30% of um, marine uh, fishes. So you can see that it's not about just ecosystems, it's also about fisheries, it's also about livelihoods, tourism activities in, for instance, small island developing states, which are hotspots of global warming. Let's take another example, overland. So overland, we uh, project for each additional half a degree of warming, a strong increase in heat waves, it was shown previously, a strong increase in the intensity of extreme rainfall. And the consequences, of course, will be different in many places, but between half a degree and two degree of warming, um, about the, the number of species that would lose their habitat overland would double. And there are hotspots. There are hotspots in the tropics, there are hotspots in alpine ecosystems, there are hotspots in the Arctic. And again, it's not just ecosystems for their own intrinsic value that is important, and the preservation of biodiversity, it's also for livelihoods. So um, what affects ecosystems also affects crop yields. So many projections show risks of a decrease in uh, yields of key crops, such as wheat, maize, corn, sorghum, um, in regions such as West Africa, South Africa, Asia. So there are challenges associated with food security um, um, with each additional half a degree of global warming. And it's not just food security, it's also nutritional security. So these are a couple of examples that illustrate that um, with each additional half a degree of global warming, we'll face different risks for different types of ecosystems, for different societies. There will be growing risks for the economy and economic growth, especially in tropical countries. And there are major risks for human security. And in terms of human security, we can think about health. Um, there are major risks associated with heat waves in areas that are both warm and humid and limits of human physiology. And we see the situation today in North India, just now, with uh, levels of, of temperatures reaching 50 degrees Celsius and stopping basic life. Uh, where you have to just protect yourself. And thinking of basic human security, it's also about water. So um, between a world one degree warmer and two degree warmer than pre-industrial, um, the number of people exposed to water stress would double. And finally, in terms of human security, it's also about development. And development, it's in the sense of living with dignity. It's basic well-being for all. And the level of global warming is really in intimately linked 
to development because between half a degree of warming and two degrees of warming, there would be several hundreds of millions of people in the world susceptible to poverty and uh, who would be exposed to compound, in some cases, climate-related risks. So that's really the outcome of the assessment of thousands of scientific papers looking at the crossroads between knowledge in terms of climate projections at the global and regional scale, but also information and scenarios about exposure and vulnerability. And it's really the value of having scientists of different disciplines working together to have this clear picture. And even social uh, science, uh, scientists, people, not only engineers, etc., but people who are aware of yeah. what is going on in the, in the human population. Sure. And, um, you know, the key things in that report is where we are now, and we still have a small window where we could limit the level of global warming. It's really tiny if we all act at the maximum possible scale. It's about where Excuse we want me, the, the to The report says it would require deep emissions reductions yep. and rapid, far-reaching and unprecedented changes in all aspects of society. So if we want to meet that goal, this 1.5 degree goal, uh, we need radical changes. Exactly. We need systems transitions we, for we, all the main are we, systems. Are we, are we on the right path for that? We see emissions still going up yes. for carbon dioxide, for methane even at faster paces in the last years. Um, so we would need, you say radical, I say deep systems transitions in all systems. So energy, decarbonization of energy, electrification of final use of energy. We'll in all have sectors. a round table uh, dedicated to decarbonation in a, memo in a moment. Major changes in land systems, so agriculture, forestry, food systems, land management, the way we develop cities and especially uh, semi-urban development that creates locks in for mobility, for instance. Uh, we need transitions in urban systems to design cities that reduce uh, the use of energy, the use of non-renewable material. We need uh, system transitions in the industry with circular economy, for instance. And we need uh, major investments in infrastructures that will support these transitions. Um, but that's the supply side. It's only part of the change. And having social scientists on board for this assessment also helped to have a balanced view of both the systematic changes in the supply side, but also the systematic changes that would facilitate transitions and transformations by acting on the demand side, so lifestyles, behavior. And for limiting global warming at such a low level as 1.5 degrees Celsius, you need to act on both as, as fast as possible. So what does it mean, the demand side? It means limiting demand for energy in rich countries, for the rich people in developing countries. It means limiting the demand for non-renewable material. It means limiting demand for food that has a large land and a large carbon footprint. And there are also interesting aspects because, of course, these major transitions means investments. So it means reorientation of finance, towards energy efficiency, towards low-carbon solutions. We can't have a cost-benefit um, cost approach. Um, some people expected that from our report. But the problem is that we don't have the tools in the scientific literature, in the economic literature, to assess the cost of climate damages. We don't have literature to assess what will be the cost of adaptation. We know there will be huge benefits, but there's not enough literature for many places of the world. We know that in some cases, there will be a cost associated with the transitions, but they also provide multiple benefits. If you reduce consumption of fossil fuels, you improve air quality and you reduce the burden of public health services. So some of the investments create huge side uh, benefits. It's the same for the food system. We are already in a situation where a, a large fraction of the world's population has too many calories and poor nutrition. So shifting to healthy food diets has benefits for biodiversity, benefits to limit global warming, and multiple health benefits, but it's hard to implement. So these are a couple of examples of the type of transitions that are needed. And we will speak about food policy during our last round table as well. Michel Kurtika, thank you very much for being here with us today. You are the Secretary of State in Poland's Ministry of Energy and Environment Ministry and you served as president of the 2018 United Nations Climate Change Conference in Katowice, uh, dubbed the COP24. Um, do you have the feeling that we are on track to meet the Paris Accord goals? 
take a microphone. Yes, of course. Yes. Thank you very much. So first, me, let me share my emotions by being here on this side. Last time I was in this amphi was 25 years ago. I was sitting uh, over there and uh, listening. So I tried to avoid the reflex of noting everything was Eric was speaking about and, and then asking myself when I will be obliged to which exam I will have to pass uh, <laughs> next. Uh, so, and and I, I, I'm quite astonished that the next time I'm here, I'm speaking in English and not in French. Uh, but that's the, the language right now of international negotiations, so that's the, 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 the right choice, probably. So first, uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, there is a global shift, uh, indeed, which was induced uh, uh, by my great uh, French predecessor, uh, Laurent Fabius. Uh, till Paris, till 2015, uh, the, mon the, the world was split. Mainly rich people were supposed to decrease emissions and then help poorer developing countries uh, in terms of adapting uh, and in terms of m making the best efforts uh, what they could what they could do and that that was basically the the system which was designed in 1992 in Rio and then confirmed in in Kyoto in 1997 but then somehow we uh, we found out that the world is different that what uh, china was uh, 2% of global gdp by 1990 it's right now 19% uh, and that developing world is uh, not anymore developing and sometimes it's developing faster than the developed world. Uh, and so, um, uh, in this regard, uh, uh, French diplomacy uh, is, is absolutely uh, excellent, not only in terms of delivery, but also in terms of anticipation, and I'm proud to be here and, and, and you can be proud of, uh, of, uh, of this. And Laurent Fabius changed the system. 2015, Paris Agreement puts everybody on the same uh, foot uh, and says it's, it's a global challenge. And we are all confronted with the same challenge, especially that right now, 80 to 90% of new demand for energy and especially electricity will be coming from developing countries, from China, from India, from Indonesia, from Malaysia, from Vietnam, uh, and from Africa. So if we want to tackle this challenge in an intelligent manner, then we have to change the framework. And that was Paris Agreement. 29 articles, principles designed principles. Uh, in order to make sure that we are able to move. And then the question was, okay, these principles are great, but how do we apply them? So I take an example. We agreed in Paris that every country produces its own nationally determined contribution, NDC, how we call it in our slang. But then you have a very elaborated NDC of the European Union saying, yes, we agree to cut our emissions by 40% by 2030. But they were countries saying, okay, guys, it's nice, but it's not written what is it, an NDC. So for us, NDC is, yes, we intend to have a strategy for energy in the upcoming five years. No metrics, uh, no objectives, uh, no transparency uh, framework in which we would be able to somehow say. So international community was somehow discussing, okay, how to maneuver this kind of new animal, what to do with an NDC when we don't know what is it. And we don't know how to make sure that uh, when we promise something, then we deliver. So this is Katowice, and this was the implementation of, of Paris to create uh, a framework. So Paris Agreement 29 articles, Katowice Rulebook 100 of very detailed texts saying what an NDC is, what the transparency framework is, what the, finance, the financial process to support it is, how do we build capacity uh, in uh, the developing states, uh, how do we transfer technologies, etc., etc. So it's the application, so but without Katowice, Paris would not have uh, taken off the ground. So you answered to the, you tried to answer to the how question, how are we going to uh, deliver these, uh, these uh, um, 
yes, these this principles that were uh, told during the, uh, the Paris Agreement. Um, would you say you were successful achieving that goal? Uh, definitely, yes, we were successful and, um, and it was not given. It was not given because the word in 2018 uh, compared with the word in 2015 was a completely different word. Uh, 2015, there was a global willingness to invest in multilateralism. There was a global willingness to, to make a step further in this uh, direction. 2018 and right now 2019, we are living in a very different world from the perspective of international politics. It's more and more fragmented. Uh, it's, it's less and less inclined to invest into international solidarity. So this is why Katowice was so important. Because once again, we were able, as humanity, and that's something really strong, humankind, homo sapiens, <laughs> agreed 195 countries, six countries, and including European Union, 196 countries, all countries unanimously agreed on this uh, new framework. And the, 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 the Katowice rulebook, the strength of this new framework, surpassed our expectations. You know, we were very much under pressure going to Katowice, and nobody, in fact, well, many didn't believe that we will achieve it. Even, uh, when I was assigned this task one year ago by my prime minister, I can tell you that I had a couple of sleepless nights. <laughs> wow. 196 countries and getting them on board is like having this amphi agree on 100 pages uh, document. Uh, it's impossible, guys. It's completely uh, crazy. But so, then we. So would you say there's enough goodwill from these 196 parties? I think that the, the, there was a, a good coupling between goodwill and yes, without goodwill there wouldn't be uh, anything. So we must recognize that among all these countries there was enough goodwill to, to, to advance. And then the, we put a framework, we put a transparency, uh, somehow leadership, and there was a good coupling between goodwill and leadership of the process which resulted in more and more trust. And when people trust, they are ready to give more. They are ready to say, okay, so if I give this, would you give this? If you don't have trust, you don't have space for this conversation. And this is what we uh, managed uh, to have in Katowice. Professor Barrett, Scott Barrett, you are a Lenfest Earth Institute Professor of Natural Resource Economics and you work at the School of International and Public Affairs, the so-called SIPA, and the Earth Institute at Columbia University, and you're also the Vice Dean of uh, SIPA. So, um, I think you told me over the phone, okay, the Paris Agreement is not a, a bad agreement, but it's not sufficient. So, and Valérie masson delmotte seems to agree with that. <laughs> well, thank you, first of all, very much for the invitation. Um, my gratitude for people speaking English, my apologies that I'm not speaking your beautiful language, and happy anniversary to this great institution. Uh, and congratulations also for selecting this theme because it is the essential theme for this century. The challenges are com absolutely unprecedented. So people really need to understand the scale of this problem. We saw a, a figure earlier of energy uh, consumption increasing, that exponential curve. We could draw lots of other curves. We could show human population. We could show income per capita. We could show uh, uh, improvements in life expectancy, reductions in infant mortality. This is the, his, the last 200 years of human development. And the key part of that history goes back to that slide of energy consumption. Taking fossil fuels out of the ground has allowed us to produce energy, which has given us this prosperity, this development. But we've taken the CO2 from the fossil fuels and put it up into the atmosphere, and it stays there. Quite a significant amount of it will stay there for thousands of years. 
So that cumulative increase has been matched by a similar increase in CO2 in the atmosphere, and this is going to transform the climate dramatically from the era of the entire modern era of humanity. Because the climate we've lived in the last 10,000 years has been unusually stable, and we're moving now into a very different world. Uh, the um, ch challenge is completely unprecedented because we need to stop putting CO2 in the atmosphere even while fossil fuels are plentiful and cheap. So they're attracting us. They want us to take <laughs> out of the ground, and it's very hard to shift this entire system to uh, move away from that. The Paris Agreement from 2015, you know, my congratulations to, uh, to the French for organizing this extraordinary conference. The entire world agreed in Paris that we should act collectively, the world, to limit global climate change to within 12, uh, two degrees uh, Celsius from the pre-industrial level. So the entire world agrees on this, which is kind of a miracle that the world would agree on anything. So my congratulations to the world. Uh, I'm not going to talk about my own country right now. Uh, <laughs> that may come up later. So the world agrees, but the reason the world can agree on a collective target is because no one's responsible for meeting it. Every country is responsible for meeting it, but no single country is responsible. And the way in which Paris was organized was that each country is, to, as we heard, is to pledge a reduction in emissions. These are voluntary contributions. Now, this is very important. If you add up all the voluntary pledges and you assume they're all going to be met, which is not a safe assumption, but if you do that, the projections that we knew in Paris are that global emissions are going to continue to increase, and it's completely impossible when global emissions are increasing for concentrations of greenhouse gases in the, in the atmosphere to stabilize. It's impossible. So we really have to separate the reality of the situation from the rhetoric of all these great successes we're having, because our performance could not be more miserable. Paris is great in some respects. It's deficient in others. The Paris um, architecture relies on voluntarism. And there's a good reason for that, but because we countries, tried a different All these countries before. are free. Huh? All these countries are, are free to... Uh, yes. You, you can you know, uh, oblige them to do anything. This is how the world is organized. There's a principle called sovereignty. And sovereignty means that countries can act independently. The problem is we're living in an interdependent system. And we all know that, which is why we come to Paris and Katowice and so on, and we agree on the collective targets. But it's also why when you ask individual countries, well, what will you do? They aim very low, despite the rhetoric. So this is the great challenge. How can we get countries to achieve the goal that they have set for the world when you've got this principle of sovereignty and the very strong power of self-interest, national self-interest? So how would, you, how would you solve this uh, paradox? Well, I don't think that the um, approach uh, in the Paris Agreement will suffice. I don't want to sound overly critical because this is an incredibly complicated problem. It's completely, uh, it's the greatest problem of international cooperation in human history. I'm completely convinced of that. So we shouldn't expect that the institutions that were created to deal with other problems are going to be wonderful for dealing with this one. So we shouldn't be surprised by this. But the only innovation really in Paris is this context uh, we heard about the transparency framework, but it's basically around what I would call naming and shaming. For which, by the way, there's almost no evidence that this is going to have much of an impact. You can, you can actually do research. We're at a, a major research institution here. You can do research to ask, well, what effect would that context of naming and shaming have on behavior? 
And I did this uh, in, in experiments with a colleague in Germany, Astrid Dannenberg, and I presented this in Paris, by the way. And the research shows that in this context, what happens is that people will declare a collective goal that's, more, that's stronger. They'll make individual pledges that are higher than they would have been without this context of naming and shaming. But their contributions, their actual actions, what they will do is unaffected. So how are you, how are you going to solve this paradox, this problem? So we've got this, basically what you want in the international system is some measure, or some ability to enforce, which means coerce. How can we get countries, so in other words. There's no coercion, coercion force uh, at the moment at the uh, world level. So, okay, so let me just step out one second because I've been very depressing and uh, I, I want to make an attempt to be a little more positive. After Paris was negotiated, a different agreement was negotiated in um, Kigali, Rwanda, uh, on limiting hydrofluorocarbons, which are a human-made gas. Um, and th this was negotiated under a treaty called the Montreal Protocol, which protects the stratospheric ozone layer. Um, now, this is actually quite an important treaty. And this development in Kigali is quite important because although HFCs are a relatively small part of the climate problem, the Kigali Agreement embeds reductions in HFCs into a system that uh, ensures that there's enforcement. And the reason for that is that there's a linkage there with, with a trade measure. So the countries that are in the agreement are not allowed to trade in the HFCs with countries that are outside the agreement. And this creates a transformation in incentives where if very few other countries are in the agreement, you don't really care about joining. But if a lot of them are in, you want to join because you don't want to be locked out of those markets. So that is a very different architecture from Paris. Now you might say, well, let's just replicate this for Paris. Uh, that's unfortunately trickier because if you link the climate negotiations, climate cooperation to the WTO system, now you're talking about a riskier proposition. And we have, I think, less leverage there. This is another area in which I'm doing uh, uh, current research now. They're basically, I think there are possible opportunities here, but there are also possible risks. And I would want to also underscore that we're living in a period right now of an attack on the multilateral system that has given the world prosperity and security and I think greater understanding. Uh, and we shouldn't look uh, so easily to restricting trade as a solution to anything, in my opinion. Um, and I, so I think that there's some opportunity there, but there are also risks. And I don't see, the last thing I want to say is, going back to pessimism, because I don't want you to be too optimistic, going back to pessimism that even in the best possible case of all the research I'm familiar with, we do not know how to change the incentives in the, in the way that we need to bring net emissions worldwide to zero. But Mr. Barrett, when you speak, you speak with such a smile that we have the feeling that in the end, the, the ending will be positive. Really well, not. you know, I, I, <laughs> I was interviewed recently by a journalist who came to me and she said, you've been working on climate change for 30 years the world is very depressed now about climate change. I wanted to ask you, why are you filled with hope? And I said, who told you I was filled with hope? <laughs> but what I also said was, I am completely determined. So there's a difference between hope and determination. Uh, this is the challenge for this generation, and it's a global challenge. And it's an intellectual challenge, it's a political challenge, it's a social challenge, but it's our challenge. So if we don't get out of bed in the morning to address this one, what else are we going to do? So I, I do think we, we will solve this problem, but we have to show this determination and we have to realize that we have an unprecedented challenge that requires unprecedented measures. Uh, Michel Kortika.
So, uh, Mr. Barrett was telling us about this uh, paradox, about the Paris Agreement. Um, what do you think of this uh, Kigali solution he was uh, telling us about, the idea of uh, making cooperation on trade, trade contingent on cooperation on climate? Would that be a possibility? Yeah. Would that, w wouldn't that maybe trigger a new trade war, by the way? We have enough of these, by the way. Okay. How do we? So, uh, I have to be aware of smiling at the right moment, so sound optimistic or pessimistic in uh, joking. Uh, I, I, I use also Montreal Protocol because it's like Montreal Protocol, Kigali was an, ad uh, an add-on, uh, which uh, is indeed uh, a source of inspiration for many because that shows that the international community is able not only to diagnose that uh, there is a problem, but also solve it. Uh, because we, we, we really nearly solved the, the, the problem. But uh, the economic impact uh, was uh, uh, very small. It was very much uh, largely financed also by uh, big guys. <laughs> uh, so, um, so we are, and, and I will use the, the word was Scott used at the last, his last intervention, we are faced with a non-precedented challenge with the climate change. Because then, as uh, my young uh, uh, colleague said, are you ready to stop eating hamburgers or at least stop putting meat in your hamburger? Are you ready to confine your holidays uh, to a mobility that can be reached by a bike? Are you ready not to heat your house uh, and so, uh, when you take the challenge from this perspective, you see that it's the right moment for Ecole Polytechnique, uh, for its 20, 25th anniversary, to rethink its mission. Because when Ecole Polytechnique was created, it was created by engineers, and they all contributed, and we are proud of them, in a way. <laughs> Uh, to civilization, to industrial revolution, to mobility revolution, to transport, to electricity, to telecommunication, etc., etc. But right now, and you are the voice of this new beginning. Yes, we have right now hundreds of thousands of uh, even younger than you, which are protesting in the streets. Uh, so that's a complete mindset, and this mindset is, I think, relevant to the challenge, uh, societal challenge that we are facing uh, right now, which, which is of, of different nature. But nevertheless, and let me be a little bit more provocative than Scott, I'm an optimist too, and especially that I'm tra trained in this school. And one of the value of this school is you shouldn't give up. Uh, Interest general, um, uh, technology, excellence, Yes, we can uh, look for solutions uh, in this space. And, uh, and when you look at international uh, dimension, it's very different what we experience here in rich countries, in Western Europe, in US uh, even, uh, because we are living in a world where, uh, I, I will switch to French if you allow, la sobriété est un choix. Pour nous. La pauvreté pour beaucoup non n'est pas un. Poverty, hunger, discrimination is not a choice for majority of human population. And we must take this into account when we discuss in the international framework about the solution. Because you have one, bi one billion people living without energy access. You have 700 or even 800. Right now it's growing number of people living in hunger. So we must take all this into account to be able to solve the global problem, which is climate uh, change, and which is an urgent problem, which is a serious problem. And we must do it, and this is why I'm coming back to, uh, to, to, to Katowice in this way also. Uh, we must do it in a, in, a, in a way not leaving anybody behind. We must do it in a, in a dialogue, in a sincere dialogue with our societies. That's the role of politics. And that's the role of politics in a country like mine. When I was learning in this school 25 years ago, my country was uh, 
a poor one in a way. It was a, considered as a developed one, but it was one-fifth, one-tenth of revenue of, uh, of France, Germany at that time. 25 years ago only, and, and right now we are 60, 70 percent of, uh, of European average. It's a country which is growing fast. And so that was in Poland that we were able somehow to have a, a good dialogue between rich world saying, okay, we need to change the, the, the way uh, our civilization is built, but also with the developing countries like China, India, and Indonesia saying, okay, guys, you profited from that for 200 years. Now what? It's our turn. Move on. <laughs> Um, we want our people to be lifted out of poverty. And we said, yes, there is a way, but we must do it together. We must change together. We must face this, um, uh, the, the, uh, all these issues together. And we must do it respecting people, putting our faith in technology, but acting. And this is completely right what you are saying. At the, the Paris Agreement and Katowice rulebook is, is certainly not an ideal solution. But it's uh, like with democracy. <laughs> uh, it's not ideal, but we, we were not able to invent a better one. <laughs> so we must move on in this framework, but it, it requires a lot of action, a lot of voluntarism. And this is why uh, uh, having a Cole Polytechnic and young Polytechnician engaged is so important. Valérie Masson Delmotte, you wanted to tell us something, and then I will ask uh, you a short question coming from the audience. Uh, you can use the Connects Me application, and I will just ask uh, one of your, your questions afterwards. Yeah, just to summarize the challenge, if you want to have a chance to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, global CO2 emissions need to decrease by a factor of two by 2030. If you want to keep a chance to limit it to well, two that's degrees... in 10 years. Yeah, they have, for two degrees, it's 25%. Uh, by 2030. So it's, it's really urgent in a way. And it, it, the, the key conditions for this to happen is governance across scales, from the city scale, you know, the community scale, to the international scale. We've only touched the international one, but there are a lot of levels, levels for action also at the local scale. Cooperation is key between countries, transfer of technology, um, innovation in a way that it's not just technological innovation, also social innovation, which is key for these transitions to take place. Um, finance, I've already touched that. But we're here in a place for education and training. Education is the thing to happen. I've acted as much as I could so that the new French school systems in high school would include a, a topic on climate change which was left over in France, home country of the Paris Agreement. There will be a major course in the last year of high school on energy and climate for all those who go for general studies. It's not enough. We need to reach out to those who will be technicians, who will act in practice in the field so that they understand the problem and also they know how to take action in all sectors of activity. We need to create a culture of risk because we've only touched uh, mitigation. But adap adaptation is equally important. There are things that are committed to change. Let's take France and coasts. Uh, sea level rise is committed to take place. We can just limit the amount of the rate. But it will happen. We need to be prepared. And thinking of polytechnic students, you know, uh, high-profile engineers trained in science, humanities, what is missing is a training to uh, implement change, create a culture of change. Um, what's missing is a training to create deliberative processes. You've, you've touched that. The Paris Agreement is key in that it sets up a deliberative process, a sort of social learning process between delegates of countries. We need the same to happen in all sectors, in all companies, in all communities, in all towns. And this deliberative process, this social learning, it's key for the transitions to be accepted by people, to make them desirable, so that people understand not only what it takes to change, because everywhere people are reluctant to change in a way. So what does it take to change? What you benefit from that? What, what will be beneficial for things that are at the heart of your values? And what's hard to our values, all of us? It's what we want to have in the, as a legacy for our kids. That's really the key thing. So building scenarios everywhere, making climate change that is abstract, visible, looking at what you want to protect, why? 
who will have a fair share of protection, those most vulnerable, what's critical, what's strategic, who will have a fair share in taking action so that we create uh, just transitions. And it's really difficult to create training for that. And my view is that it can only be learned by doing action. So you, you mentioned by taking action, it creates optimism because you know that you can succeed for small changes, but you need to bring people on board. So how to create a curriculum for students of Ecole Polytechnique that does not stay in Ecole Polytechnique, where students are part of changes at community scales or with companies or with NGOs or with new types of approaches, using social networks, for instance, to engage with other young people at other um, types of studies, other schools, practitioners, not just those who will be high-profile executives, so that you learn how to bring pe people together. Because you've touched it, political will is key, but it's not enough. It's not enough in democracies. You need societal will to change. And we need to, tr to train leaders able to create that societal will. I will ask you to make a, a short answer because we are getting quite late now. Um, there's a, a question from the audience and you just used the, the, uh, the Connects Me uh, app for that. Someone uh, ask you, um, asks you, how can we hope countries to follow a non-prescriptive report while many of them come to be ruled by, by climatoseptics? <laughs> Mr. Barrett, please. <laughs> Would you have a <laughs> Well, it's not going to happen. Uh, we have to elect different people. <laughs> but uh, we, we, in, the, in the U.S., companies and states yeah. you know, are, are... Yeah, so I'm going to tell a very different story. Because I think that what we're seeing is there are a lot the of... federal nice, level and there are a lot other of nice levels things well. being said. Well, okay. when, you see, when you see action at the, the state level, cities, uh, communities, my household, your household, et cetera, et cetera, you know, most of that's just an expression of the failure to have action where it should be, which is, first of all, at the international level, and secondly, at the national level. That is the problem. And these other things we're doing, it's just, we're just, we're, that's not, the, the right place for action is much higher. I really want to come back to the scale of this problem. People really need to understand it. This is not about modifying our lifestyle a little bit here and there. We have uh, uh, billions of people, and population growth is growing. There's an incredible hunger for, for development, for growth. There are a lot of fossil fuels. They're close to the surface of the ground. People want to extract them. People want to burn them. And people want to develop from that. We have to offer an alternative that is um, more attractive, not only collectively, but somehow individually. So we've changed incentives. So these people who have these aspirations also want to do what's in our collective interest. And the scale of this problem is so severe, in my opinion, that we need to be thinking about much more radical technologies. So not only technologies for, removing, for moving away from fossil fuel, renewable energy, and so on, but also new technologies to remove CO2 from the air, where it's causing these problems, and to put it away somewhere else. And another thing that drives the climate, and this is very controversial, but I want to mention it now because people really need to understand the scale of this problem. Another thing that drives the climate is not just greenhouse gases, it's reflectivity of the Earth, which we modify all the time. For example, a lot of the pollutants we have that are, that are killing people from, from air pollution are also reflecting uh, light away from the Earth and cooling the planet about half a degree centigrade right now. Um, one idea is we would deliberately, we would engineer reductions in global mean temperature by putting particles into the stratosphere. And you may think this is crazy, and it does sound that way when you first hear about it, but the alternative is also crazy, and that is that we let this system, um, climate system, uh, undertake fundamental change, much of which will be nonlinear and irreversible. So we're moving to a world in which we have very difficult choices to face, and there are also profoundly new governance problems that we've never faced in the world before. So this, the entire global system is really being uh, challenged now to deal with a very, very different future. Thanks very much. Mr. Kortika, very shortly, please. Uh, yes, uh, to, to, to leave something to be debated for the next, so I only half agree with Scott, uh, and for the purpose of uh, leaving some questions for the next stage. 
half because yes indeed we need an unprecedented uh, level of involvement in research and development we need more money uh, and that's great and Philip Drobinski you have a, a great challenge ahead of you a corporate we'll must be here um, the, uh, the excellent center but uh, we lived in, uh, uh, in 18, uh, 19th century, in the century of intergovernmental action. Then we slowly added on top of governments, companies, NGOs. But we are in the 21st century. Now everybody has a social media. You all have a Twitter, you all have a Facebook. You all can communicate. I mean, it's a free word. Let's use this opportunity. The, the, the change can come from our uh, uh, behavior, from ourselves. We shouldn't underestimate it. Uh, and we shouldn't because it will be at the level of society that new inventions will be happened, and that's your job. And, and the second is that you are the voice of democracy for tomorrow. You will be voting for politics tomorrow. So if you want to change politics, change yourself, and then they will uh, come back to the answer uh, of, to the question that Scott uh, said. Okay. The European youth has a lot uh, voted for ecology parties during the last uh, European elections. So I, I would like just to be clear. It's not about skepticism what we are talking about. It's about denial of science, robust science, that has been confirmed and refined in the last 30 years. So we need to call things by the right term. And climate skepticism, as you say, is not the main challenge. Um, you have caricatures. But the key thing is indifference and fatalism for me, not, not denial. The only way forward is literacy, climate literacy, education, science programs, explaining how science works at all levels systematically, and we need support for that. We need support for that everywhere at all levels. Change happens. 2015, Polish Academy of Sciences. I'm invited to give a talk on climate science. Well, I have to say there was an expression of skepticism very strong. 2018, a symposium organized by CNRS, um, the uh, Pontifical Academy, the Polish Academy of Sciences in Katowice. Amazing the change that has happened in minds over three years. It's amazing. So there are things that can change. We have to overcome indifference, fatalism, but we also cannot rely on risky options that will put an amazing burden on future generations on ethical grounds. You call it um, new technologies, I call it palliative care. If you don't act on greenhouse gas emissions and believe you'll mask it by aerosols or whatever, it's palliative care. You don't act on the cause. You try to mask symptoms. There's no international governance for that. It's bringing new questions. And we had lots of reflections on the ethical side, whether we should address that or not within the IPCC. And we decided yes. So in the next IPCC sixth assessment cycle, you'll see an assessment of what science can say on that, not just on how the climate system operates, but also in terms of govern governance and ethics, which I think is more fundamental for these type of technological options than um, the physical science side. Okay, we all agree on the fact that this is the biggest challenge humanity and the planet as a whole was ever faced with. Uh, there's so much to do even after the Paris Agreement and it takes determination. Thanks very much. Uh, we will uh, be back in 20 minutes, which means at 11.15, be right on time, please. Thanks very much to uh, you three, Mr. Barrett, with Madame Vasson Delmotte, and Mr. Kurdika. Thanks very much. So we will be back at 11.15. Be on time. Thanks very much. <laughs>